We are very excited to have Dr. Craig Blomberg with us this morning. He got his PhD from the University of Aberdeen. He's the Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Denver Seminary, and he has written and edited numerous books that have helped Cliff and myself so much when it comes to college campuses and debating, whether it's professors, students. Dr. Blomberg, I wanted to start simply by asking you perhaps a more personal question on with each book you come out with that's especially a lot of them are geared more apologetically, but then also to theologians and I think to pastors and students, every book you come out with, would you say your faith increases or kind of just remains the same? And I also kind of ask this on the heels of, because I'll run into people, especially Christians who will say, no, I don't really get into the apologetics or too much of the theological books because I'm actually afraid it will hurt my faith because I'm nervous I'll run into something that somehow will show that you know Jesus didn't truly die and rise from the dead. How, how do you think through, how do you communicate those kind of issues? Well, there's nothing I've written that's hurt my faith. <laughs> um, and certainly over the years, um, earlier in my career, um, there was a lot that uh, simply reinforced what uh, um, I thought I was coming to believe. Um, I suppose uh, when you get to a certain age, uh, just like you don't have dramatic swings of emotion in other areas of life, uh, I don't really have any. Um, I, I, I shouldn't say this as if it was prophetic, but I haven't had any crisis moments or uh, amazing boosts, um, kind of a level personality. So, <laughs> but certainly, um, as long as people are open to reading uh, multiple sides of an issue, uh, there's no reason uh, to be afraid of these kinds of questions. And if anything, you'll have your faith strengthened or lack of faith challenged. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, so two of his newest ones, Can We Still Believe in God? Check it out. We'll have the links below. Excellent read. And then the historical reliability of the New Testament, a much bigger one that, gosh, right now I'm working through the contradictions or supposed contradictions we have in the New Testament. Tremendously helpful. So guys, check those out. And Cliff, I know you have some burning questions. <laughs> Craig, what are the tests that you use to determine the historical reliability of any text? There are multiple uh, criteria that historians use. Um, you ask questions about, uh, first of all, do we have a reliable copy of what was originally written? If you have reason to think you're pretty close, you ask, do we know who the author is? Do we know the time period or circumstances in which they wrote? Are they likely to have had eyewitness or other uh, oral tradition that would have been preserved reasonably well? Do they cite sources or do we have reason to believe they have sources? I'm, I'm just getting started. I don't know how many you want me to list. <laughs> those are good. I like those. How would you apply those tests to the writings of Papias? At times when I've debated people like Dr. Bart Ehrman, uh, they have cast quite a bit of doubt on the reliability of a Papias. W what do you think of Papias? How reliable are his writings? I guess we don't have too many of his own writings. We get them through Eusebius, I believe. Right. How do you handle that? Yeah, that's, uh, it's always difficult um, when you don't have uh, the actual documents that uh, an ancient author wrote and you know about them just from... Uh, selective quotations from someone else. Part of the way to answer that uh, question is um, how reliable is the person who quotes that person in general? And uh, while nobody is ready to put Eusebius in the, the canon of the Bible, there are many who would say he was the, the first true church historian and uh, is credible on uh, a wide variety of things that he discusses. 
Um, the other issue that you have to ask is, uh, is there corroboration from any other writers? Uh, there's very little that people tend to quote Eusebius on Papias from that isn't at least in part corroborated in other ancient Christian writers. And so uh, when we see that, then that should give us uh, a little more confidence that on those issues, uh, Papias may be credible. Good. What about Genesis 1, 2, and 3? What's the literary style? <laughs> How precisely do you handle Genesis 1, 2, and 3? But really, what is the literary style of Genesis 1, 2, and 3? Or Genesis 1 to 11? Well, I've never written on that, so uh, I didn't expect you to uh, raise that question. Um, I have gone through many phases in my uh, lifetime of... Uh, thinking and studying and speculating about Genesis. And the uh, one thing I don't want to be is uh, dogmatic in a way that immediately alienates people who have a, a strongly felt view otherwise. Um, but I think, uh, and I can quote my uh, good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Rick Hess, who chairs our Biblical Studies Division and uh, has taught Old Testament with us for uh, more than 20 years now, uh, that there certainly is a, a strong sense of poetry in Genesis 1. There certainly are often noted correspondences between what's created on the first day, first three days of the creative week and uh, what's placed in those things that are created on days four through six. Uh, to suggest that we certainly don't have to take that as uh, um, necessarily uh, literal seven days or literal young earth. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are many other viable approaches. When you come to chapters two and three, um, you have uh, one thing that I don't hear a lot of people saying or commenting on is if you study the sermons, if you study the messages that people derive from these two chapters from wildly varying perspectives, all the way from absolute literal history to uh, pure myth or legend, the amount of agreement and what the stories mean is remarkably similar. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good reminder that uh, whatever we do with the, the genre of the text, um, I'm inclined to uh, think that we have we have some kind of foundational um, saga to try to come up with a, a neutral term that basically explains the nature of humanity as we find it and uh, how it got that way. Mm -hmm. And that much can be affirmed uh, whatever literary form you uh, you ultimately identify it as. Mm -hmm. Switching to the New Testament, it seems to me that Luke was... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me that Luke was a meticulous historian. Did he get Quirinius right? How do you handle Corinthian? <laughs> um, I asked that question, Dr. Blomberg, and I yeah, I'm sure I have as good an answer as I'd like to have. Well, um, I knew there's a reason I brought my Bible in um, for this interview. It's always good to uh, see what the text actually says um, in debating some of these things. Um, reading from the NIV, uh, beginning of Luke 2, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken in the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Footnote, always important to read footnotes, especially in this digital world where you can easily not notice them. Yeah. Um, or this census took place before and then it continues, Quirinius was governor of Syria. I am tempted, 
although it is the, the minority view among scholars, and hence uh, it, it only made it into the footnote, to say that perhaps that latter translation is the correct one, and therefore, um, end of conversation. Not nah, Quirinius wasn't governor until AD 6. That was too late for the time of Jesus' birth. But if people say, no, that's not the most natural translation of the text, um, then it's interesting to look at the verb. Uh, we translate it as a, as a noun, but uh, you could also say Quirinius was governing. Um, it comes from a stem that basically means uh, in a leadership role of some kind. Um, it certainly is not as specific as we think of in the U.S., where governor automatically, uh, unless you've just watched My Fair Lady and are thinking in Cockney language, uh, it means uh, somebody who heads a, one of the 50 states. Uh, and there certainly is testimony that uh, Quirinius was involved in leadership roles uh, prior to him being uh, named uh, the head honcho, if you like, over the province of Syria in 6 AD. So there may be uh, a more informal reference that's going on there. Um, the other interesting fact are these censuses. Um, we have... Um, Unfortunately, uh, records only from Egypt. Uh, we have an awful lot of archaeology from Egypt because it was so amazingly dry and things are preserved that never would have been preserved in Rome or in Italy short of having a volcano suddenly explode and cover up Pompeii or Herculaneum. And so we know that in Egypt, under the Roman Empire, there were censuses every 14 years. Um, we don't know if that was a, an empire-wide practice, but it's intriguing to speculate uh, if it were. And uh, we know there was in, in 6 AD uh, a census that Quirinius was involved in. That puts us back to about 8 BC, um, maybe even 9, if depending on whether you're counting Certainly there was no year zero, but then you still have to decide, are you including the end dates or not in your counting? But a Roman census that began in 9 or 8 um, BC, as we date things today, would have taken easily a couple, three years to complete as, as uh, we didn't have the internet or any modern forms of communication. And so from that angle, uh, along with reasons that uh, um, people suggest uh, from Matthew, uh, Herod ordered all the babies up to the age of two to be killed. Herod himself didn't die until the year we call 4 BC. Um, maybe that means Christ was born in 6 BC. Interesting. That could be right about the time a census that began in 8 BC finally made it to Israel. Um, so there's no one definitive solution to the debate over Luke 2.2 and Quirinius. But uh, I like the writers. I like what my own mentor, Howard Marshall, said years ago. Um, Colin Hemer, another uh, meticulous Acts scholar, uh, has said this. There certainly isn't enough information to say we know Luke was wrong or that it's even likely Luke was wrong. We probably just don't have enough of the information that people once had. Thank you very much. That makes sense. Sorry to go on so long. No, that was great. So Cliff's questions are much better than mine. But let me try and hit you here with a slightly different angle. You are a distinguished professor at Denver Seminary. The state of the seminary right now, I know we both went to Gordon-Conwell, ah. and Gordon-Conwell, it still has a good backing financially, but I, I've seen you know the dining hall and a, a lot of other areas that they've really had to scale back on. This is a spiritual formation department, and a, a few, like Andover Newton and other 
seminaries around have gone under. I think the div schools are back like Yale and Harvard around here are doing just fine. But how do you think through what if the seminary in general at large kind of goes away and, and just we lose it here. We've got more of a, a secular age, just a growth in the religious nons. What happens there? One, are you are you concerned or not concerned so much about that? And then two related to that. And I'm guilty of this as well, but I see it as problematic. I, I think people's hearts are in the right place when they say it, but their heads are, to, are oftentimes not. And that is, hey, look, Craig, just read the Bible for what it is. And so Piper and Carson had this debate, how important is context? How important is the original languages to look at? And Piper went more so the root of, well, just, just read the text. Now, obviously Piper went further than that, but you have Carson saying, no, no, context is king. You need to look at these kinds of things. Does it concern you when Christians say, oh, oh no, you don't need to read theologians. You don't need to read seminary professors, anybody like that. Just read the text yourself. Oh my goodness, you have embedded so many questions in, in that. Um, my wife hates I, me. I'll, I'll, I'll go backwards from the actual question that you asked at the end. Um, of course, it's concerning when anybody says that, and there's nothing new about that charge. Uh, Anti-intellectualism has been deeply embedded in uh, American Christianity. Uh, we have been uh, described as, as unlike Europe uh, at the time of the, the settling of the continent uh, of being a very populist religion. And in some ways that has been our strength and it has uh, kept uh, the country uh, being very religious when certain official institutional forms of religion or education have had scandals or been unable to afford to continue or uh, dried up or otherwise uh, just discontinued. Um, but it's interesting, um, a man from your part of the, the country, uh, Gordon McDonald, uh, was our interim president in 2009 and 10, and then graciously came out several times a semester to be our, our uh, chancellor for uh, 10 years. And he made the comment repeatedly um, and I've seen this happen too, that uh, the people who go into ministry um, for all kinds of reasons, thinking that they don't need Bible college or seminary or, or specialized education, get about two years into ministry and are overwhelmed and suddenly realize, oh my gosh, yes, I need this. Um, and so to tie that question in with um, where you were starting, um, we have this year, to everyone's astonishment and praise God, the largest entering class in our history of 246 new students uh, out of a total of about 900. And uh, more than half of them are online. Um, this is certainly the wave of the future, um, whether we like it or not. I mean, look at how we're con conversing. And so, uh, most of these are people already in some kind of ministry and therefore they're not gonna up and leave and they're gonna look for what they can do and supplement uh, their work, their ministry uh, by getting the education that they've now discovered they want and need. The other trend is that um, the majority of students who go to seminaries these days are not going to seminary to become senior pastors and many of them are not going to become pastors at all every kind of ministry professional that you can think of uh, is being considered. Um, when I started at Denver 34 years ago, um, we had this huge growth uh, trajectory in counseling students and everybody kept saying, this isn't, this isn't natural, this isn't expected, this is gonna peak very soon. And 34 years later, there's no end in sight because we have a troubled culture and people want and need counselors. And so we are now approaching. Um, this is not a scoop. I don't know if it will ever happen. Don't you dare quote this out of context. 
But at least the idea has been floated that maybe we need to do what Fuller did years ago and have a school of theology and have a school of counseling um, because we're close to uh, not in terms of numbers of faculty, but in terms of numbers of students, we're close to parity between the number of people studying counseling and the number of people studying everything else. Um, and uh, we may well hit 50-50 within a few years. Uh, we're actually beginning uh, only the second um, Christian seminary PhD in counselor education. It will start a year from this fall um, because the only other one that exists is Regent University in Virginia. And uh, there are huge demands for school counselors and public schools all around the country are open to Christian counselors so long as they behave themselves and, and don't violate separation of church and state. And uh, there are um, demands for people who can teach counselor education for those people. Um, and something like only one out of 10 openings is getting filled because there aren't enough trained people. Uh, it's a wide open door for Christian mission, if you think about that as a form of Christian mission. Um, I'm with Dan Allender, who for many years was the president of the Association of Theological Schools, who told us at a faculty retreat maybe 10, 15 years ago, it's really hard to kill a seminary. Um, Andover Newton was in decline for years before it finally closed its doors. Um, Gordon Conwell, is doing great stuff, but a disproportionate amount of it's in Charlotte. And it's time for, I have some inside scoop. Um, it's time for a few people who are standing in the way of doing creative things in South Hamilton to retire. Um, they're well past the normal retirement age. Um, and now I'm probably in complete trouble with everybody, but that's okay. I'm retiring soon too. So, I, I love that you extended past the reliability of the Gospels, and now you're into the full reliability of the New Testament. You have a, a nice section on Revelation in your new book here. We're getting a lot of questions at our church about, does Revelation have anything to do with the kind of time that we're in now? A uh, personal question of mine was, it was Paul schizophrenic? Did he have a schizophrenic episode when he wrote Revelation? How do you think through that issue, I obviously tied to it, is is God judging the U.S. or the whole world at this time? How would you help, especially a church person, also a non-believer, but mainly a church person, think through that with mainly looking through the book of Revelation? Well, the first thing I would do, um, and it's a mistake that I make too often myself, is to say I believe John wrote Revelation, not Paul. Um, but we are so used to talking about Paul that sooner or later we attribute every book of the Bible to him. Um, <laughs> You may not realize you said when Paul wrote Revelation. Did I say Paul? Um, <laughs> you did. But uh, I, I would say two things. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would say two things. I would say, yes, Revelation has a lot to say uh, to our contemporary world. And then I would say, secondly, and Revelation perennially has a lot to say, especially in times where uh, there seem to be uh, numerous global or wide-scale things of turbulence, um, both in terms of natural phenomena as well as uh, problems among people and people groups and so forth. Um, what I don't do is uh, follow the meme that I just saw my wife discover yesterday and uh, post on the website of my colleague, Dave Mathewson, who's our revelation expert and has written already four books on the topic from one angle or another. Uh, and it uh, has this picture of a guy looking outside his window. Uh, and uh, the caption reads, um, just checking to see which chapter of revelation we should study today. Um, <laughs> it, it's uh, there. As often as Christians have felt like the signs of the times um, are pointing to 
dramatic things uh, out of the Bible corresponding very closely. Um, and maybe in the Old Testament, they tend to go to Daniel and in the New Testament to Revelation. Um, if you study church history, every generation without exception, every 30 year period, and in the last two to 300 years, every decade has had people looking at what was going on in the world and drawing those correspondences. Those who have said, this shows that we can confidently say we are living in the last generation. Number in the hundreds of thousands. And to date, 100% of them have been wrong. <laughs> which is probably a pretty good tip off that we should exercise some humility. One day, one group of them will be right. But meanwhile, let's let's be a little humble in our predictions. Mm. Excellent. Craig, I've been pinned against the wall by people who say there's too much violence in the Bible, be it God calling the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Stalactites, and all the other tites. Mosquito or, bites. Yeah. <laughs> or who? The mosquito bites. The mosquito bites. <laughs> thank you. Or uh, Jesus talking so much about hell and, the, and Revelation talking so much about the judgment of God. How do you respond to the amount of violence in the Bible? What is God communicating? How do you take that? Um, again, I have to credit my colleague with Rick Hess with, with helping in so many ways, his commentary on Joshua, his Old Testament introduction. You have to distinguish carefully between what is prescriptive and descriptive. There is only one military enterprise in all of scripture that God's people were actually commanded to undertake. And that was the conquest of Canaan and entry into the promised land. Every other battle they fought um, was defensive. Um, in the New Testament, I think uh, Dan Reed and Tremper Longman's book uh, a few years back uh, is so helpful there. Uh, all of the imagery of literal military warfare is transmuted into spiritual warfare with Ephesians 6 being the, the classic text there. Um, there are no commands to Christians anywhere, not even in Revelation, to go to war. There are predictions that some will be victims of war, but uh, I actually liked as a kid growing up Lutheran, the hymn in our book, Onward Christian Soldiers, but I was taught that's a metaphor. And um, not everybody has been taught that in the history of the church. Um, even in the Old Testament, um, it's, it's unfortunate that people use the language of genocide because if you're going to speak strictly, that means uh, the obliteration of a people group. And that's not at all what happened. Um, there were Canaanites left in the land and that becomes part of the storyline for much of the Old Testament. There were ways in which people could avoid judgment. Uh, I marvel at the story of Rahab in Joshua 7. Here's a prostitute. Um, here's a woman who is at the bottom of the social class in her society and is an outcast as well. And when the spies come to her, she says, everyone in the whole land has heard of how you have conquered the kings of, the, um, of Og and Bashan, and everyone uh, is terrified of you. Um, there is, in principle, no reason why um, the entire land could not have done what Rahab did and said, the logical thing to do is surrender and, and serve your God. We have the, the strange story of the, uh, the people that, uh, is it Gideon who encounters them with uh, um, 
they're pretending to be travelers from far away. And when they're found out, they are willing to be, be sold into slavery to avoid um, going to war against um, the Israelites. And unlike any other group that we know of, the longest you necessarily had to be a slave in Israel was seven years. And then came the sabbatical year and you could be set free. Um, of course, you have to go to the New Testament to get uh, a full-fledged um, movement toward the abolition of slavery. But all of that is to say, and other things, other points could be made as well, that um, it was not genocide. It was never attempted genocide. Um, there is a lot of language of hyperbole throughout the Bible. All often means the general trend. Um, I like to use the example of uh, the stereotypical teenager who says, Mom, but everybody's doing it, which means at least my two best friends are. Um, <laughs> and I, I do think all means more than that in the Bible. But um, put all of that together. And then at the end of the day, we have to have a robust doctrine of progressive revelation. God could not, with the peoples of four to 5,000 years ago, um, dump all the gospel of justification by faith and um, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Um, the Messiah hadn't come. The whole storyline of scripture is God working patiently and slowly with humanity, with a grand vision of incorporating all the nations and everybody within the nations who wants to be a part of his people. Um, but to do that, you've got to get to the end of the story. You've got to get to the New Testament. And there are things that should really be much more problematic for Orthodox Jews who don't have the New Testament than for Christians who can say that was temporary. Look where it's all pointing to. Now, is there final judgment at the end of the day? There is. And I have yet to meet anyone, although I've had interviewers on air try to wiggle around it. But I have anyone, I have yet to meet anyone who does not want there to be ultimate justice in the world especially for themselves and for the most vulnerable, uh, most victimized people of our world. Um, and unless you have something like the Bible story of final judgment, uh, there never will be that ultimate justice. What's so interesting about that is this past fall, we were when we were at one of the major universities, I remember Cliff asked a question about heaven and asking simply, do you college students want to go to heaven? And a lot of them said, no, we don't want our eternal destiny to be like that. We, we want life to end here. There's so many questions about heaven that are the unknowns and we don't even really want to get in that. But to your point right there, as soon as we brought up, well, don't you want a judgment day? Don't you want some type of justice? Not a single one of them said no to that. They said, okay, wow, yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of, obviously, it doesn't have anything to do with this kind of Western mindset of everybody is saved and and ultimately, well, no, we don't want there to be a hell. But it is kind of connected to that. And, and so it was just interesting, especially in our hyper, hyper-focused culture on injustice that we do ultimately want justice even if you don't believe in god my question for you craig would be in working through different supposed contradictions oftentimes we'll hear you know people say oh the bible it's a joke because there's so many contradictions 
I think there is this fallacy that people make, which is if you find a single potential contradiction, then you write off the whole Bible versus, I mean, there are many history books we can turn to where there will be multiple holes in those history books, right. but people still take them as history. And so you see this complete double standard. How do you work through, what, what are some contradictions that you've perhaps struggled with more than others? I know you bring up the blind men in the historical reliability of New Testament. How did, has that shaken your faith or how, and how, also how do you respond to these people who, who say that? It's almost like they hold up the standard of the Bible has to be totally inerrant or it's a joke. Unfortunately, I think one of the first things that we have to do is admit that the evangelical movement, particularly in the United States over the past 50 years, has promoted and has exacerbated that logic. And I have met and read far too many Christians, conservative Christians, thoughtful, well-educated Christians, who say exactly that. It's inerrancy or you throw it out. Hmm. And that's one of the reasons that people have uh, fought the, the Bible wars, uh, a lot of them back in the 70s and 80s. Um, but many of those people were young, assertive, influential, outgoing men and women who have lived until quite recently or are still alive. Um, but I am grateful that you recognize that that's not how anybody functions as a historian. And, and so I think we, we need, uh, we've got a, um, a news campaign uh, to uh, undertake to say, no, if you find minor incidental problems, as in fact, most of the differences among the gospel parallels are, there's very little that ever affects the heart of being able to summarize what this story or account or sermon or event in Jesus' life was about that everyone agrees on, that that's exactly what you find in, in the best of other ancient historians. And that doesn't impugn people's overall credibility in the least. Now, at the theological level, sure, it does mean that you use other terms if you take that tack, other than inerrancy to speak about the authority of scripture. But those options are out there and they've been out there for a while. Um, they're not the road that I go down. Um, I recognize um, having gone to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School at the height of the Bible Wars, when there were all kinds of brand new, young, exciting New Testament scholars like D.A. Carson, Douglas Moo, Grant Osborne, who's now passed away, Scott McKnight and so forth. Well, no, actually, Scott was my my peer. He was my fellow student. He came back later and taught. Um, we were exposed to the best of New Testament scholarship. I never found anything that I had to admit or thought I had to admit was a genuine contradiction or an error. But so much of that is related to uh, standards of precision in hmm. storytelling in the ancient world. Um, and uh, I sometimes invite students to think if the world lasts another 2000 years, um, what will be the technology enabling us to determine, well, hopefully we'll be done with instant replay. Um, <laughs> hopefully there will be, I mean, probably there will be no human referees of any kind. And there will be some almost omniscient computer that will 999 million times out of 999 million and one get the, the call right and do so instantly. And they'll look back on the 21st century and say, you guys did what? And you settled for what kind of accuracy? Um, 
and you had referees apologizing after the fact that, yeah, they admitted they blew it and a whole bunch more who should have. Um, <laughs> well, that's how we have to think about the first century. Um, when the most precise timekeeping device is a sundial and you didn't wear it on your wrist, um, and if you weren't in the part of town that had one, you kind of guesstimated the time of day by the sun, if it was even out, then to say that something happened at the second hour or the fourth hour when it really happened at the third hour, nobody would have batted an eye at that. Um, and lots of other examples could be given. Thank you. Craig, what is the importance of the John Rylands manuscript? What is the importance of the earliest Greek manuscripts that we have of the New Testament? Why are those significant? Does it disturb you that we don't have more manuscripts closer to the date of writing? Or does that not disturb you? When uh, Bart Ehrman points out so graphically that there are between 200 and 400,000 manuscript variants, I think at times he doesn't point out as clearly as he could that those 200 to 400,000 manuscript variants are found in 25,000 manuscripts, which exactly. means about eight to 16 manuscript variants per manuscript or portion of manuscript. What, what are your thoughts about the manuscript evidence for the New Testament? It's overwhelming. Uh, it's overwhelmingly abundant compared to uh, what we have, what, what we are aware of uh, for any other book uh, from the ancient world, including things, anything else written before the time of Gutenberg and the invention of the printing press. Um, and the significance of uh, John Ryland's fragment of a handful of verses out of John 18, uh, coincidentally including Pilate's question, what is truth, uh, is precisely what you said. It's, it's the oldest known fragment. Um, probably sometime in the first half of the second century. Uh, people try to date it more precisely than that, but if we're honest, we, we really don't have the ability to do that. Um, we have numerous uh, slightly later uh, second century uh, document portions. And then as we get into the third century, they proliferate. And as we get into the fourth and fifth centuries, we have entire New Testaments, and in some cases, uh, the Greek Old Testament uh, with them as well. Uh, the significance is that we can compare and contrast and see what kinds of changes scribes made, um, both what seemed to be completely accidental and some that were probably intentional, but not because anybody was trying to distort the text. Uh, Christian scribes had a long history of Jewish scribal activity that they were carrying on in the footsteps of, and everything we know about it suggests that when a scribe intentionally changed a manuscript, it was because he firmly believed that the copy he was working with had a mistake and he was restoring what he believed uh, would have been the original. Now, as it turns out, that probably didn't always happen. Um, so from that point of view, then you could say, well, they're all unintentional mistakes. But uh, the Ehrman in his better moments, um, when people like uh, Dan Wallace have kept his feet to the fire in uh, now published debates, uh, will admit that uh, there's not a single doctrine, there's not a single ethical practice of the Christian church that hangs on any disputed text. And one of the unfortunate things that um, Ehrman's writings, particularly um, uh, back in the, the 2000s, the first decade uh, of this millennium, uh, often did was to simply highlight the differences that do exist, talk about a few of the dramatic uh, examples, and then raise the question, how do we know that there aren't other yet to be discovered um, examples every bit as dramatic? Mm -hmm. 
And the answer is we don't, but if something were to be discovered, it would be categorically different from the ones we know about because the ones we know about have been known about since the second century. There is an unbroken tradition of those 25,000 Greek and other language manuscripts. And if something emerged that added 10 verses to the end of pick your book, Philemon, told about how he really was freed and went on to become the Bishop of Ephesus as later tradition claims. We would say, we may not be sure where this came from, but it is virtually impossible that it could have been the original and every trace of it having been lost for all time given the unbroken tradition of second century church fathers commentary as well as later manuscripts uh, it would be the greatest uh, successful conspiracy in the history of the world to have somehow hidden that from all subsequent world history and yet have been what Paul originally wrote in Philemon. And those are the comments that, that unfortunately Bart doesn't make, although Dan Wallace does. What would you want to say to Bart as a New Testament scholar? And what would you want to say to Dr. Ehrman as a friend, as a fellow human being? I know that uh, there are folks, uh, I think Mike Lacona in particular, who've had the opportunity uh, to get to know him as a person. Mm -hmm. um, I have not had that opportunity. Uh, I have with some other high profile, skeptical uh, New Testament scholars, but not with Bart. Um, I think I would want to address the second question first. I would want to hear his story. I've, I've read uh, the introduction um, to, uh, I'm drawing a blank, what's his famous book from 2006 uh, that popularized all of this. Um, Is it Misquoting Jesus? Misquoting Jesus, thank you. That's what's called a senior moment, which, uh, I've been having for years, but now that I'm officially 65, I can legitimately uh, claim it. Um, he tells the story of um, coming to faith through um, parachurch organization in his high school after having been raised in a mainline Protestant church and being very active as a, a teenage Christian and going to Moody Bible Institute and then going to Wheaton College. Uh, and in the 70s, unfortunately, um, Moody was much different than it is today. Um, I actually had a professor at my liberal Christian liberal arts college, Augustana, which is in the same conference as Wheaton, um, in, uh, in Illinois, also in the 1970s, once say, if you want a control group for scholarly change, go to Moody Bible Institute because they never change. Um, well, they have, and they're in a much different place today. But he got a lot of this all or nothing mentality. And he got some of it at Wheaton as well, which has also changed a lot over the years. And then he went to Princeton Mm -hmm. And as he tells the story, uh, wrote a paper on the problem of Abiathar versus Ahimelech as to who was the high priest when uh, mm -hmm. Jesus quotes the story of David eating the sacred showbread at Nob. And he actually used a tried and true conservative argument to, uh, to defend uh, that there's not a contradiction there. And the professor wrote on his paper words to the effect of why not just admit that Mark made an error. Mm -hmm. Well, Craig Evans thinks he did. And Craig Evans is one of evangelicalisms. He's not an inerrantist, but one of evangelicalisms 
greatest gifts to scholarship. I mean, it just doesn't matter whether it was Abimelech or Abiathar, Himelech or Abiathar. Now, I would disagree. I would go back to John Wenham uh, in his article in JTS in 1950, where he says uh, um, the word epi that's used there is not the normal word um, to mean in the time of. In fact, you have to go through Bauer's classic lexicon through about 13 or 14 definitions before you even come to that. Hmm. But there is a place in Mark's gospel where Jesus is debating with the Sadducees and whatever he said in Aramaic, it's translated into Mark's Greek as epi, the bush in Moses' day as in the burning bush. And we have to translate it as in the passage about the bush. Well, the passage about Abiathar makes perfect sense because Abiathar is the, the better known character over several chapters um, of the Old Testament and Ahimelech is one character in that passage. I don't know if that's the article or that's the argument Ehrman used. It's the first thing that came to mind when I read his, his autobiographical comments. But um, I, I still happen to find that persuasive, but I am never going to go after Craig Evans, perhaps the way Lydia McGrew and some others have done and, and the way she's gone after Mike Lacona, though I don't agree with everything Mike does either. And I think Lydia's got a lot of good points. And you can edit all that out if it's irrelevant to your interview. But uh, um, <laughs> the, the, the point is what we said earlier. If there's one error, there's one error. And if it's a trivial error, it's a trivial error. It's not all or nothing. And yet Ehrman claims, mm -hmm. and I don't know enough to know if there's more to the story that he's not talking about. Sometimes there is with people and sometimes there isn't. Um, he claims that set him on a trajectory uh, to agnosticism, right. but uh, there's absolutely no reason that it should have. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love where you're, you've gone with miracles, and that that's a pretty audacious uh, feat for a theologian, a seminary professor. I, I see a lot of pop writings on it. I'm not going to. We have a friend who's written on miracles. And I love what you say here in your book on 678 of the historical reliability of the New Testament. Indeed, today's most significant challenges to the credibility of the biblical miracles come from the discipline of comparative religions, exaggerated or simply false claims in the media or blogosphere as to supposed parallels and antiquity to the miracles of Jesus and the apostles mislead those who are gullible and just looking for quote unquote reasons to disbelieve. I love that. I mean, so where are you going with that? And with that in mind, think about miracles in the Old Testament, New Testament, and potentially today, And unless you're a full-blown cessationist. How do you think through kind of that quote, or what you clearly wrote there in your book, which again, I just love that quote. Uh, we get put on the hot seat on a semi-regular basis for the miraculous when we're at different university campuses. What's kind of your response and your focus here on, on miracles that's truly helpful? Again, lots of directions one could go in. Um, the way you started the, the comments, I was tempted to interrupt and say, I just ride on Craig Keener's coattails. Um, he has, in his two volumes uh, on miracles, uh, not quite a decade ago now with Baker Books, um, collected and documented five or 600 of, of the uh, best attested and corroborated um, parallels to every kind of miracle you find in the New Testament without exception, although the majority are physical healings or exorcisms. Um, if you can read through that carefully and then write Keener off, um, you have no, uh, uh, and write him off without any reason for writing him off other than you just can't believe it. Uh, you have no legitimate claim to being a scholar, a historian, 
a philosopher or a scientist. Um, but that most of the people that write him off have never even taken the time to to go through it that carefully. Um, I had one atheist friend who said, oh, yeah, I, I watched one of his things on YouTube and, and he wasn't his personality wasn't very compelling. It's like and that's how you judge <laughs> this kind of an, this kind of an argument. Um, I have participated in uh, healing services and seen miraculous healing. I've had close friends and family members who have had um, the most extraordinary experiences. I've wished I could have had one. Um, God's never seen fit to miraculously heal me after any of my injuries. Uh, but um, there's absolutely no way, whether I had the Bible or not, hmm. that I could deny that this stuff happens. Um, and and it's fascinating to me uh, the number of times in conversation with atheists, the response is, well, if God would do that for me, I would believe. And I just hear Jesus to Thomas in John 20 shouting, although I don't think he was shouting loud. Um, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Um, if God worked a literal supernatural miracle for every human being, then there would be no free will. And people would be compelled by the evidence to believe. But that's not the universe God wanted to create. He wanted to create a universe where there were enough reasons to believe and enough reasons to doubt so that people who chose him would choose him freely for a voluntary love relationship on the interpersonal level. Um, I'm not a cessationist, but then neither will I ever come remotely close to the health wealth or prosperity movement or any uh, approach that says, if you just follow this formula, if you just have enough faith, if you just obey enough, if you just send enough money to the telephone number on your screen, um, God will work this miracle for you. Um, that is by the scholarly definition of the term magic, manipulation of the gods by ritual or formula. Mm -hmm. um, that is not something that you ever find in scripture. Um, of course, you find things with parts of parallels that make people think it is, but then you've got to dig and study the issue much more carefully. So-called parallels in other religions, um, it is fascinating to see how the majority of the closest parallels to the, at least the miracles of the New Testament, all post-date the New Testament. So if there is an influence, it's the New Testament influencing somebody else to make up a story to try to compete with Christianity. You do get some partial pre-Christian parallels, but what you don't get are um, parallels of things happening within the lifetimes or within living memory of the people who are reporting them. Uh, they are in the distant past and oftentimes on closer inspection, they really aren't parallels. Richard Carrier in his book on the historicity of Jesus in which he questions whether Jesus ever existed. He phrases it very nicely in the book, but then in, in public settings, he just flatly denies that Jesus ever existed. Um, he defines resurrection as, or resurrection account, as any story of a person being seen or perceived or thought to be alive after death. So every story about 
somebody's immortal soul temporarily having some visible form of appearance. Those are all over Greco-Roman mythology. They're everywhere. But that's not the Christian story, and it's not the Jewish belief of resurrection either. Those are not bodily resurrections, but Carrier never makes that distinction. And if you call him on, he says, well, that doesn't matter. They're still basically the same thing. So you have to look at these. And then, sadly, um, one of the websites uh, that I used to point people to uh, was taken down. Hallelujah. Um, but you can still search and you can still find books and you can still find um, 19th century works that were debunked at the end of the 19th and early 20th century being revived today in the early 21st century by skeptics. Um, some of them influenced by uh, James Fraser's The Golden Bough. Um, and, and they say, oh yeah, this is uh, so-and-so was uh, born of a virgin and uh, Mithras was born of a virgin. Well, he sprang from a rock. I suppose the rock hadn't had sex, but that's not what we usually mean by virgin. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, he, he was resurrected every year. Um, well, let's see. His body was cut into 12 parts. He was consigned to the underworld. And yes, every year his body was reassembled, but he never left the underworld. And this is just one of many uh, Greco-Roman myths that's based on the cycle of the seasons, things that happen annually. That's not a close parallel to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and then sometimes they just flat out make stuff up. Um, this one website that fortunately was taken down was something like 10 pre-Christian redeemer figures demonstrably having parallels to 12 different miraculous aspects of the life of Christ. And, you know, you start looking at some of them and actually go to the ancient sources. And of the supposed 12 parallels, there's actually only three. And they're about as close as the ones I've just described. And somebody just made the other stuff up. And people believe it. But then they don't believe serious historians. And all I can conclude at that point is they are not interested in the actual evidence. They're just interested in pseudo reasons not to believe. Wow. Dr. Blomberg, this has been excellent. Thank you so much for coming on with us. Thank you so much, Greg. It's been an honor You're to very be welcome. Here. Keep up writing the great writing. You've been a very Thank helpful you. to us. Now, Thank if you, you guys much. are anybody who's new with us, hit that subscribe button and hit the bell too. We've got a bunch of new discussions and debates coming out this week. Tomorrow night, big debate uh, with PZ Myers. So don't miss that. So that subscribe button, the bell. And Craig, thanks again. Here are some of his new books, The Historical Reliability of the New Testament. We will have those in the links. Definitely get your hands on them. And I'm serious on this one because the more we really head into the secular age here, in the U.S. I, the Christian faith is popping up all over the world in different ways, but we've got to be equipped. And thank you again, Craig, just for equipping us. You're very welcome. All righty. Have a good day.